Good afternoon. My name is Laura Weinstein, and I am the Ananda Kumar Swami Curator of South Asian and Islamic Art at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Thank you so much for having me take part in this conference. I'm very grateful to be here and to be able to share a little bit about the collection that I work with. Um, and thanks in particular to the IGNCA Bangalore for reaching out. I am I'm thrilled to have been invited. Today, what I will do is just try to uh, give a little bit of a snapshot of the view of Kumaraswamy's career and life that one has from where I sit in Boston, uh, where I work with a collection of art that was formed by him and with various kinds of archival materials that give some insight into his life and career. So I'd like to share that with you today, as well as a little bit of background and history. I know that there are many in the audience today who are very familiar with Kumar Swami's life and work and career. Um, so if some of this is well known to you, please forgive me, but I will um, try to provide a range of information from the kind of general introductory information about his role in Boston, his time in Boston, all the way to some of the more detailed information about the information we have in the museum where I work about the collection that he formed, um, its history and its provenance. So let me begin by talking a bit about how he came to work at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston in 1917. Kumaraswamy came to know a man named Denman Waldo Ross, who was one of the very important early donors to the Museum of Fine Arts. And he came to know him in the 19 teens and they began to correspond. We have a number of the letters between them in the archives of the MFA today. There's a letter from J July of 1916 in which Kumaraswamy wrote to Ross and he said, the number of Rajput and Mughal paintings and drawings in my collection is very large. There are also stone heads, unpublished bronzes, ivories, illustrated manuscripts, and works of handicraft. He describes the collection in order to try to convince Ross that this was a collection that should come to the Museum of Fine Arts. At that time, Kumaraswamy was well aware that the MFA already had a large collection of Chinese and Japanese art, in fact, the most substantial collection of its kind in the US. And the MFA was helping to kind of write the story of Chinese and Japanese art history for an American audience. And Kumaraswamy felt that his own collection that he had formed could help to make that picture of Asian art more complete, could introduce American audiences to a more complete view of arts of Asia. And in particular by adding to it this very important chapter in that story, which is, of course, the art of South Asia. So he described his collection to Ross. And, um, and then he says, um, right before signing off, he said, I need, I need hardly mention that there is no museum at present where even a small collection of Rajput works is exhibited. So he was also trying to particularly present um, the fact that this was a cutting edge collection um, that contained works that couldn't be seen elsewhere. Later that same year, Denman Ross wrote back to Kumaraswamy with interest and indicated that not only would he like to see the collection come to the MFA Boston, but that he also could see sending Kumaraswamy to South Asia to make purchases to round out the collection. Um, and he, he proposes at first to borrow the collection before purchasing it, but ultimately that is not exactly how it came about. Um, the next year in March in 1917, Ross wrote to Kumaraswamy and told him that it was a difficult moment. Um, the World War I um, was looming and that brought a great level of kind of uncertainty to the MFA and he let them, he let Kumaraswamy know, and I'll quote here, that under these conditions, the disposition of the committee on the museum to make the purchase of your collection, although it was at first unanimous, is passing. 
several members of the committee have said this is no time for large undertaking. So there was a concern about going ahead with the purchase of Kumaraswamy's collection for the MFA due to the impending war. Um, and as a result of that, Denman Walderoth steps forward personally to buy the collection. And so, and uh, once purchasing it immediately, he gifted it to the MFA for its long-term safekeeping. Uh, Ross was also very helpful in arranging for Kumaraswamy to come to Boston and serve as the curator of his own collection. And indeed he did so becoming a member of the curatorial staff. You see here a, a wonderful portrait of members of the of the all male at that time curatorial staff, uh, Kumar Swami came in 1917, and originally he was in the Department of Chinese and Japanese Art. They created an Indian section, um, and he was called the keeper, using the British terminology. But by 1921, Kumar Swami's role had widened, and it was no longer just the Indian section but he began to be responsible for Persian and Islamic art as well. Um, and at that time, he became keeper of what they called sections of Indian and Mohammedan art. This changed again in 1927, when the title became keeper of Indian, Persian, and Mohammedan art. And at that time, the department that he worked in was changed over to the Department of Asiatic Art. So, um, we have a, a very similar structure today, almost 100 years later, where there is a Department of the Art of Asia at the MFA Boston. And within that department, I am uh, the person responsible for the South Asian collection. Um, and I work alongside colleagues responsible for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean art. So there is a wonderful um, continuity over time, which means that I'm always very aware of the fact that there is this great legacy. And I um, hope to convey to you all today my respect for that collection and that legacy. Uh, moving on, I wanted to share with you, we do not have many images of the galleries and displays of uh, Indian art that Kumaraswamy created during his three decades at the MFA. Here are two images from the 1930s that give you a little bit of an idea of what it was like um, in that decade, in the 30s. Unfortunately, I haven't yet uh, located images that show the collection in his earlier years, but this gives you a little bit of a sense of the kind of relatively spare um, um, but very elegant displays that were created in that period. So I want to now switch over to talking a little bit about the collection in more detail um, and how it came together. So let's begin with the collection that was formed before Kumaraswamy came to the MFA and that is now today known as the Ross Kumaraswamy Collection. <clears throat> So the Ross Kumaraswamy collection refers to objects collected by Kumaraswamy between about 1906 and 1916. And this is the group of objects that he wrote to Denman Ross about and eventually sold to Denman Ross in 1917, which were then gifted to the Museum of Fine Arts. This includes about 750 objects. And certainly the vast majority are works on paper, paintings from Rajasthan, and the Punjab Hills. There are also a number of 3D objects, a small number, um, and particularly their small bronzes, um, some from Sri Lanka, and a couple of different parts of South Asia, uh, of India in particular. Um, and I just want to point out on the right, I've given you um, an image of Denman Waldo Ross, so you can get a picture in your mind of what this other important figure whose name appears in the collection, you know, what he looked like. He certainly also played an important role. Here I'm showing you perhaps the uh, small bronze from this Ras Kumaraswamy collection that was most important to Kumaraswamy. He um, published this Sri Lankan Avalokiteshvara sculpture over and over and over again in his career, particularly in the 19 teens. Um, 
he was particularly fond of this sculpture because I think it showed um, a history of Mahayana Buddhism in Sri Lanka in which he was very interested. It illuminated that history of early Buddhist sculpture in India, which he was very keen on uh, researching at that time. Um, he also seemed to appreciate the, the kind of fluidity of the pose um, and often likened it to a dance performance that it had a, a spontaneity and gestural beauty that was something that was kind of integral to the image of sculpture from South Asia that he was trying to write about in his work. So I, I'm sure some of you will have seen this in his publications. This is a tiny little bronze, but one that was very important to him. Among the paintings in that Ras Swami collection, there are some that are finished paintings. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this uh, wonderful Basoli Rasika Priya. Kumar Swami was lucky enough to collect a group of these paintings. And so we have um, a group of them, about I think eight at, in the MFA's collection um, that are absolutely um, masterworks and highlights of any display of Indian painting that we do. He also brought together a large number of finished pieces from this Ragamala from Orcha, central India. But, um, and, and oh, and I wanted to show the kind of, um, the fact that he's collecting from different regions. So we went from um, Basoli further north to central India, um, all the way to the Deccan. A couple of works in the collection are from the Deccan, uh, such as this painting, which um, is believed to be the son of Malik Ambar. Again, a, a finished painting, in this case on an album page. But by far the majority of the works um, of the works on paper are unfinished pieces. So for example, we have here, you know, a fairly well finished um, portrait with a with a very intricately completed and beautiful face, although the background, as you can see, is not finished, and neither is the dress, the carpet on which the figure sits. Um, there are many works like this in the collection. Um, here you can see a partially completed Ragmala painting on which somebody, the artists have used the page to um, uh, to help shape their brush as they're about to paint. So all these little marks on the right and left show that, that stage in the artistic process, the painting process. Many, um, what you might call sketches or preparatory works, perhaps this was a model for something that could be used elsewhere, or perhaps it was simply an unfinished work. You can even see in the lower left of this page that there's another scene underneath the scene we're looking at which is beautifully drawn, but but um, certainly not what we would think of as a finished work of Indian painting. Um, and then there are many works in, you know, some stage of being painted. Uh, I particularly love this one. Um, so many, many works that he seems to have purchased from artist families. Presumably these were works that were kept and passed down over generations that were used as models that were um, kind of formed pattern books and be, could could be kind of an inspiration for, for a new work of art. Or maybe they were just things that never got finished for some reason and never got thrown away. But the quant the you know the large quantity of unfinished works like this that make up the Ras Kumar Swami collection does suggest that he was buying directly from artists and artist families in many cases. And it also means that the collection is really valuable for the insights it gives us into the painting process. <clears throat> There are also a number of wonderful um, completed or draw, drawn portraits such as um, that, that have an interesting historical value. For example, the portrait of Sir Charles Metcalf. Um, you may be familiar also with this wonderful large drawing for uh, that is by the Jaipur painter Saheb Ram. This was a study for a very large painting that's in the Jaipur City Palace Museum today. So, Within the collection of works on paper, some of them are study drawings that are really incomplete and, and really mostly illuminate the process of production. But some of them are um, drawings that are that have a completeness in and of themselves and are, are striking um, and very beautiful that are displayed um, as, as masterpieces in their own right. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of that Ross Kumaraswamy collection that came with Kumaraswamy in 1917. Now, after 1917, Kumaraswamy 
collected with and for the MFA in order to round out and expand the collection that he had founded. And so he uh, uh, collected approximately a thousand objects from that time in 1917 when he arrived till his death in 1947. These were acquired through many different routes. Um, sometimes they were works that were donated by art collectors with whom he developed some relationship or uh, or things, or maybe perhaps people that he didn't know so well, but objects that were donated un to his care. And he then uh, kind of incorporated them into the collection and wrote about them and cared for them. Um, he also did acquire objects directly from art dealers. And finally, he traveled in South Asia for the MFA and purchased things during those travels. So this post-1917 collection has a much wider range of media than the Ross Kumaraswamy collection. It includes paintings, yes, but also coins, seals, palm leaf manuscripts, jewelry, bronzes, sculpture, and, and many other things. Um, textiles is one that we don't have listed on this slide, but which is certainly important. And I want to just mention that what I'm describing here does not include the large collection that was formed in this period, not through Kumar Swami's collecting, but through an excavation that the Museum of Fine Arts took part in at the site of Chanu Daro in 1936. So that forms an additional uh, large segment of the MFA's collection that was formed during Kumar Swami's time, but uh, he was not um, the collector per se. <clears throat> I want to show you a couple of highlights from the post-1917 collection. And again, these are things that you may have seen before. Um, a wonderful um, palm leaf manuscript, a very early palm leaf manuscript, one of just a, a handful in the collection. Um, the Kumar Swami's famous Shiva Nataraja. This is, of course, not an early Chola Nataraja, but rather one produced around 1900. Kumar Swami never did acquire for the MFA a 10th or 11th century Shiva Nataraja. Um, he acquired for the MFA in this period, though, major sculptures that were from um, antiquity, such as this Gandharan Maitreya. And I think I just want to pause and mention that his collecting at this point, I think, did show that he was intending to try to be somewhat comprehensive in bringing together objects from a range of regions across South Asia and time periods, even when they didn't suit his particular taste. And so for example, with this Gandharan sculpture that you see here, um, we have a letter where he wrote his sort of recommendation as the keeper of the collection, recommendation that the museum acquired this sculpture. And in that letter, he says that this work was not to his particular taste, and yet he still thought it should be acquired. And I think uh, for those of you who are familiar with his writing about um, the, the origins of the Buddha image, you will understand why he wasn't necessarily passionate about Gandharan images of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the same way he would have been passionate about a Maturan Buddha. But um, the fact that he kind of overcame his own personal taste in order to try to um, flesh out the collection, I think that's very significant. Um, and even in line with his own principles um, that he believed that art should speak to uh, a, an underlying logic rather than any one person's um, taste. So that gives you a little bit of a, of a taste of the kinds of things he was acquiring after 1917. Um, this is taking us in a very different direction, but I just want to mention that <clears throat> some of the things that came into the collection reflect not ancient or medieval um, South Asia, but reflect the time he lived in himself. And so we have a print in the MFA's collection. The original of this work is a drawing that is in an Indian collection. Here we have a print that depicts a get together at the home of Abhinandranath Tagore in Calcutta. It depicts um, uh, Gaganendranath as well as Samarandranath Tagore and then Kumar Swami himself and Nandalal Bose, the artist. So um, this is probably a reference to a couple of different things. One is that in 1909, 
you may be familiar with the fact that Kumar Swami spent three months with the Tagores in Jorasanko. And here, this sort of seems to illustrate the kinds of things they did together, sitting on the veranda of the house, entertaining each other, maybe making art, having conversations. <clears throat> in the bottom right corner of the print, you see Nandalal Bose sitting on a mat on the floor. He's holding a board and he's dipping his brush in paint and he's looking up at Kumaraswamy. So you see Kumaraswamy's head is just about there in the middle. He's reclining on a divan and it looks like the two of them are in conversation. There's books and manuscripts nearby and a hookah. And then above um, is Samarendranath seated reading a book. I'm just taking you through this in detail because it's a very dense composition. Then you have Gaganendranath and another divan also reading while smoking a hookah. And at the very, very top is Ambanendranath Tagore, who appears to be fast asleep. Uh, the, the scholar Pratabaditya Paul has written about this print extensively, and he has suggested um, that it was probably written, uh, that it was probably produced around 1946. Um, so it was done many years after the time that Kumaraswamy spent with the Tagores in Calcutta. So perhaps it was done by Nandalal Bose um, in 1946, right around the time of his 70th birthday, Kumaraswamy's 70th birthday. So maybe it was kind of like a, um, a way to remember the close collaboration that Nandalal Bose had with Kumaraswamy, as well as the collaboration with Kumaraswamy on the catalog of Indian painting that was collected by the Tagores. So maybe Bose is attempting to kind of bring together this productive and happy time that Kumaraswamy spent with this community. Despite the fact that Kumaraswamy did have this relationship with the Tagores and Bose, he did not collect art from the Bengal school or other modern Indian um, schools of art for the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, there are a couple of works such as this one in the collection, um, some of them given in Kumaraswamy's honor after his death, but he himself did not bring the collection um, up to the present day. That does not seem to have been one of his major concerns. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the research that um, my, some of my colleagues and I are endeavoring to do at the MFA to begin to understand a little bit more about the provenance of the collection. So Kumar Swami's collection came um, you know, in 1917, that's quite an early date relative to many museums, um, as was the kind of collecting that he did in the 20s and 30s in Boston. Uh, so it's wonderful that we know that that um, the history of these objects back to that time, the time of their accession by the museum. But in many cases, we don't know where Kumaraswamy acquired the objects. So for example, the 1917 uh, acquisition of the Roscombe Kumaraswamy collection, I mentioned all of those works on paper. We don't know very often where he acquired or from whom specifically he acquired a work on paper. And more and more, the MFA, like other museums, is trying to dig into archives and books and other kinds of sources in order to find out more about where these objects came from. It's part of our responsibility um, in, in, as a museum, as an, as an institution that holds the collection in the public trust to try to understand um, how these objects came out of South Asia, as well as to make sure that they are being shared with the public today and taken good care of. So I wanna give you a little bit of a view into some of the things that we know and some of the things we wish we knew about the collection formed by Kumaraswamy. Here is an example, which is um, kind of special in that we know quite a lot about where this object came from. So in the Ras Kumaraswamy collection, we have this full manuscript, Jain manuscript of the Kalpa Sutra um, and the Kalakasuri Katanakam. Um, this is something that we know about because Kumaraswamy left behind some wonderful documentation. So in particular, we have these notes um, which were typed up, which tells us that the manuscript was originally purchased <clears throat> specifically from the library of Puj Kripa Rishi, a Jain, a Jain priest in Pati, Punjab. 
And so that is wonderful and relatively rare for us to have that kind of information. Um, but it's so it's really a gem when we are able to locate something like that. Another example of uh, times when we do have a little bit more information about where he acquired a work on paper is when we have things that have this stamp um, on the back of the work uh, of the piece of paper. Here we're looking at the stamp of uh, one S. Bahadur Shah, who was a dealer of what he calls curiosities in Lahore <clears throat> in the in the early 20th century. And it's from S. Bahadur Shah that Kumar Swami acquires, for example, a large group of unfinished paintings, uh, one of which you see on the left here, um, de depicting the story of Nala and Damianti. So sometimes we have a mark on the paper itself that tells us where it came from. Uh, a slightly different example is uh, a, an event that happened in 1921. At that time, Kumar Swami was traveling in South and Southeast Asia, and he was traveling looking for objects to purchase for the MFA. And he wrote letters back to the MFA as well as sending telegrams. Um, and in this case, we have uh, a letter where he's saying that he had secured a gift, uh, sorry, secured the purchase of a group of bronzes from a private collection and that he was going to acquire for the MFA. And these were from the collection of the British collector and businessman, Sir William Beardsell. Uh, we know his date of death was about, nine, was 1940. Uh, Beardsell ran a company called um, W.A. Beardsell and Company that was based in Chennai um, beginning in 18. 87. I, as yet, don't know that much more about beard cell, but I know that there are a number of people who are interested in researching this very early, uh, kind of unusually early um, collection of, <clears throat> of bronzes um, and, and finding more out about its story. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more in the future. For now, it's just wonderful to have that information, at least back to beard cell about a group of objects. You see a couple of examples here. Uh, there's some um, treasures of the MFA's collection. This one is interesting. It was actually not purchased from, but a gift from William Beardsell. <clears throat> a different kind of example um, is um, a group of objects that we again have letters and documentation about uh, that again came to the Museum of Fine Arts in 1921. And this was a case where the um, what was then the Madras Government Museum gave fragments from Amravati to um, to the MFA through Kumaraswamy, and you can see in this letter he, he Kumaraswamy writes, "I have secured from the Government Museum Madras a magnificent collection of Amravati reliefs, some decorative and some with figures. All these I have obtained as a free gift. Our only expense being packing and transport. I will." Um, show you a couple of examples. Mostly this gift was comprised of fragments from Amravati. This is a rare kind of uh, beautiful full um, lotus roundel on the left here. Most of the Amravati reliefs were much more fragmentary. Um, in this gift, there was also one um, wonderful um, late Gupta bronze sculpture of the Buddha, which you see on the right here. Um, the gift uh, from the Madras Government Museum also included some woodwork. These were, interestingly, um, fragments of woodwork from the house of uh, Comte de Lally. He was a French general who lived 1702 to 1766. It was a French general who commanded his own regiment um, in the Seven Years' War that ended in 1763. He um, was um, he, he failed to capture um, what was then Madras and lost to the British in that early battle, and he was forced to surrender, which um, I think was related to the fact that ultimately he was actually beheaded in France for his kind of military failures in India. So a fascinating figure. Um, and so Kumar Swami secured the gift of a number of fragments from his home, which I believe was in Pondicherry. 
Um, with that, I want to kind of close that portion of my talk. And um, I want to say a few words before I sign off about resources at the Museum of Fine Arts that you all, uh, or those of you who are interested in learning more about the collection, um, can, can gain access to. Um, so I think first and foremost, um, the resources that we have for people who are interested in Kumar Swami, you know, primarily it's the, the collection itself. Uh, the collection is, of course, um, accessible in the gallery of the arts of South and Southeast Asia at the MFA. So there's a fairly large um, permanent gallery where we display works from the collection. This gallery primarily has um, three-dimensional objects, sculptures, bronzes, smaller objects, um, objects that are not light sensitive. And for anyone who is passing through the Boston area, I encourage you to come and see uh, the works from this collection that are on view. <clears throat> we also have, of course, um, the painting collection that is not shown in this space, but it's shown in another room. And we do periodic displays of Indian paintings um, from this collection. We will have one um, starting in early 2024. And I believe, I'm hoping that we will continue to have um, exhibitions of the Indian painting collection for uh, at least two or three years from, you know, beginning early next year before we take a break and, and the museum may use that space to show other painting collections for some time. But um, we we show the painting collection as often as we can. And um, and so it can be accessed, accessed that way in person. But I want to point out to you that you can also go online to access the collection if you aren't able to be in Boston um, yourself. Here, I'm just showing you a screenshot of the collection search page on mfa.org. <clears throat> if you go to MFA Boston and look uh, at the collection search, you can just put in Kumaraswamy and that will bring up, um, let's see, uh, 1,488 objects. This contains almost every single work on paper that was in the Ras Kumaraswamy collection. We have everything, let me correct myself, everything is on the web. However, um, almost everything has a photograph. So if you go here, you will you will see pages and pages and pages of um, paintings from the Ras Kumaraswamy collection that do have wonderful photographs that you can access. A couple of things, mainly things that need major um, conservation treatment have not yet been photographed. But um, we're quite proud of our website in the sense that it does allow people to access the vast majority of the collection through this um, online um, uh, avenue. <clears throat> Kumar Swami's correspondence, as you probably know, is mainly at Princeton University, although there's also some at the IGNCA in Delhi. At the MFA where I work, we have a small archive of Kumar Swami's correspondence. They are mainly things that relate to his professional work as the keeper, the curator of the collection. So they don't as much relate to his scholarly work, his research, his publications that were done outside of the museum. Um, so it contains correspondence from 1917 to 47, as well as some drafts of publications and articles and other items. On the right of this slide, I'm just showing you a one page from a document that we've created, uh, which is a finding aid. Um, basically, this is a document, an extensive description of the contents of the MFA Boston's Kumaraswamy archives. And that has been formed so that people who may not have an opportunity to come to Boston can find out what kinds of materials are in the archive at the MFA. Uh, we always want to support research. So, um, this is a document that I can make available to anyone who is interested and people who, for example, are interested in, you know, box two, folder 13, letter 2D can contact me and I will provide scans of letters. Um, there is a limit to how much I can do because I am just one person. We don't have a whole staff to support this particular archive. 
but um, I believe very strongly in sharing this material as much as possible. And uh, I'll just finish with something that I'm very proud of having shared just um, over the last year for the first time through a partnership with the American Institute for Sri Lankan Studies and Princeton University. The MFA has been able to photograph and digitize four albums of photographs that were made by Kumaraswamy and Ethel Mare Kumaraswamy between 1903 and 1906. So this is the time, a uh, very early period when they were living in Sri Lanka. Um, Ethel was photographing um, craftsmen, sites, objects, um, craft techniques, and they produced four albums. I believe these are the only albums in existence. Um, they contain the photographs taken by Ethel with captions written by Kumaraswamy. And because these are such important documents of an early moment in Kumaraswamy's career, and because we believe there are no other copies of them, we felt that it was important to make them accessible virtually. So they have been digitized fully and you can now find them on mfa.org through the collection, collection search um, by searching Sinhalese Minor Arts. Um, but you can also find them through the Princeton University Library, which is um, what you see a screenshot from in the bottom right corner of this slide. Um, Princeton has a wonderful feature where you can really page through the albums as if you have them there on a table in front of you. <clears throat> I hope this has been um, helpful, uh, particularly this final part. I hope I have shown you all that there is a lot of material um, that can be researched, that needs further research, and that I welcome um, the interest that the participants of this con uh, conference have in Kumaraswamy's uh, work that relates to the MFA. Um, I have um, always had a, a fascination and a lot of respect for Ananda Kumaraswamy. Uh, and I am very pleased to know that I'm part of a large community uh, you know, all of us are interested in his work and his life in different ways. And I am thrilled to be able to participate. I hope that this conference is one that leads to many others and that I have a chance to talk in person with some of you in the future about the things that I've brought up today and about Kumaraswamy in general. Um, so I will close just by saying thank you once again for allowing me to contribute to the conference. Um, thank you to the organizers for putting it together. And um, I look forward to more collaborative work in the future. Thank you.